years to uh, Coastal Carolina University in uh, South Carolina. I did a, a drum set clinic for the, for the students there. Now this whole thing uh, took about two and a half hours. So now I have to consolidate this and I'll probably touch on a few of these uh, statements as well as probably coming in and had living and which is what jazz drummers do and come up with different ideas to try to keep things interesting and if there's questions in between fine raise your hand and I'll stop and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability but um, talked about uh, th uh, different types of, of drum solos which are like uh, the regular drum solo that you would hear uh, a time oriented drum solo and uh, an open ended or free form type drum solo so what I'll do is just go ahead and start off with something that's just freeform and open. I mean, there's no type of meter really being uh, explained in such a way that there is a, a type metronomic basis of what's going on. So it just has to do with a lot of different sounds and colors and sonorities. And what I do with the sonorities as far as keeping them long or short or whatever it may be. And take the vibration of this snare and restart. I could add more to that, but I mean, just to give you an idea what drummers do in such a way as to take up some time to set like uh, a precedence for what the song may go ahead and come up with in, in the next fashion. Uh, I drum for Swing House, which a few of you people understand uh, or saw us play uh, a number of times at these indoor alumni shows, and uh, like I'm, I'm right out front. And the horn lines on a curve linear, Larry Kirshner is in the center, and I'm just right next to him. So we tried it a, a few times uh, in the past when it was Music Express, and I was in the center, the horns were around me, and uh, you just get washed out. Something like this just has to be uh, audible enough to go ahead and uh, make a mark with what I have to do to support the horn line as far as setups, uh, fills kicks, little drum solos here and there, exaggerations, uh, expressiveness, and it all comes through in, in such a setting where, where I'm at out front. And it's a great clinic for, for young drummers to go ahead and see what a, what a big band drummer does, because that's exactly what they do. Uh, I've done this since the, the middle 60s, playing with different big bands and small jazz ensembles, quartets, quintets. Uh, I've been on the road with circuses. I've played over 40, you know, uh, a number of musicals, and had my own clinic. Uh, studio, so and do a lot of judging, jazz band adjudication and a marching band adjudication, and in the past the drum drum corps world. So uh, the idea of what I do here is based on what I was done in in the past with growing up and being un, under uh, John Flowers and in, in the Buccaneers, you know, back in, in the mid '60s, and. Uh, 
uh, him giving me lessons. I had three instructors before him, and I was with him for a year, and uh, you know, I was only playing cymbals at the time, but uh, he knew downstairs there was a drum set, and I got a chance to play with the drum corps in the 60s uh, when we didn't have, I guess, all the music for a couple of the tunes. So I played bugle corps, rag, and sing, 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 and it was great. Probably about 60, 65 points on stage. So that was my first indoctrination into uh, doing something with a drum corps as a drum set artist. And I didn't even think of myself as, as an artist, just a drum set person, like only 15, 16 years old, and playing with these guys. So one thing led to another as far as teaching different drum corps in the, in the past, like the cadets, uh, the Buccaneers, some work with Southwind and, and West Shore, so, and then tons of, of marching bands. So, but when, I, when I'm playing with, with some of the, uh, the jazz bands, like in the past, uh, I was playing some time, a jazz, a jazz feel. <laughs> Drum solo, time feel, drum solo, time feel. So I'm thinking time feel. So I'm playing four measures. And that's not exactly what the drum uh, the, the director wanted. He wanted a time feel. And I'm still learning the, the art form of, of the instrument. So then uh, a couple guys said, no, just stay with the time feel. So I had to like really rethink that real fast. So four measures of time, and then four measures of a time feel. Still keep the ride feel happening. Independence with the left hand from bass drum communication, interacting with the snare. And that's what they want as far as the time feel is concerned. Uh, with uh, uh, Birdland, it was, uh, it was different when we do that on stage because it's a lot of hard driving, it's a lot of high energy, and uh, you have to be you know, like really in your face as far as what you're doing and how you're doing it and, uh, and why uh, do I do what I do. I mean, that would be a, a good clinic too as far as what I do, why I do it, how I do it, and, and when I do it. So, but. Um, I utilized the hi-hat, and I got the, the hi-hat idea, I put that in the middle of the drum solo from, uh, well, I've seen Buddy do it a number of times, and uh, Fully Joe Jones, and Joe Morella, and one of my jazz teachers in Reading. But then, uh, the first clinic that I went to, I saw Roy Burns, and uh, he said, this, this is a musical instrument. Well, obviously, I knew that, but I'm just thinking, what, what's he going to do with this? Well, I'll just give you a little bit of demonstration on what what he did with this, and then I added a couple other things to it as far as carrying over concepts from uh, uh, the greats of the past.
I use, uh, it's like a spit. When you break a finger, you have to have something like tied to the other finger or a piece of wood to go ahead and support that. So I use the index finger and I use the middle finger as a splint to give it some stability and sturdiness. And I catch the, the, uh, the curv curvature of the, the hi-hat inside uh, with the pocket or the webbing uh, of the hand. And then, right here, these two knuckles on the fourth finger and the little finger are up against the hi-hat. So there's support and there's control. There's a little bit of flexibility and, and movement that I get away from the hi-hat. But that's the whole key on something like that. And then when we place something like that, and I've seen Buddy do this a number of times, uh, and just very, very simple on, on one, two, three, four. As simple as it is, when he's playing something slow, I mean, not, not just the fact that he doesn't do the whole chart, just a few measures, but it's, it's very cool. And then again, this, the, the webbing catches the inside of the symbol, and then I'm using the middle finger to go ahead and take that stick you know, into the shaft. So, um, <clears throat> interaction of the snare and the bass. I mean, kids ask me a lot of times, what do you use when, when you warm up? And uh, it's always different. It's never the same. It's always something a little bit different. Uh, it may be a rudimental passage. It may be some, some type of groove. Uh, and I just stay on the snare and work the snare and work the hands and try to work the technique and the fingering and the wrist action and the flexibility and the movement of the hand because really with, with the drum set I have this motion down but when I'm moving over to the tom I mean there's a lateral roll over motion so what's happening just on the snare if I just start on some type of rudimental pattern if I stay with some type of flam configuration right after the snare. So then if we go ahead and add there's a lot of interaction with the tom and the bass and the snare. So now we're getting more sonorities, more colors, and then we splash the hi-hat for a different type of cymbal effect. And then sometimes the rim shot, the ping rim shot, or the gawk rim shot. Overutilize her with the left hand. And then maybe crush. And then open that up with an upstroke. So I do a lot of that. Right? Pressing down just to bend the tone a little bit.
Put this back on. Also, are we on? Are we on? Yes. Yeah. These uh, talk to um, Saul Harold. No. It's not working. I'll check and see if the batteries are doing. Oh, well, your green light is on. Any testing? Too loud. Okay. Testing. Testing. Uh, testing. No good. This is where you're Yeah. Um, talk to Harold Jones, the drummer for the uh, the Count Basie band, and uh, at, at Pace at PAS in Columbus. And he said, "You ever notice these these Latin guys, these timbali guys? I mean, they always play everything so far out of time." Uh, just listen to him. Harold has a lot of uh, experience playing with, with different bands. He's in the West Coast. But I saw him in Reading in, in the '60s, and uh, uh, they just got done doing that Basie Straight Ahead record. A uh, picture of uh, the count with a blue background, and then we started talking you know, at, at that at that show, and he said, "Yeah, these two Bali guys like are just like way out there on on the, on the rough edge." So, so for instance, I mean, you've seen yeah, Tito Puente and other guy Latin all stars in, in that manner. So they're playing. <laughs> To something in time, you know, this is a, a foot pedal mounted, you know, into the, the cowbells, uh, Richie Kahate uh, pedal, and he devised uh, the bracket where you can go ahead and have a rod, you can put a, a jam block on there, or a cowbell, or anything else that you want to put on. So, but if you go ahead and, and play certain things, but try to keep solid with the time, it becomes somewhat challenging. So we start out in time. configuration with a big band and you're just playing all over the, all the, the cymbals and the drums and there's nothing solid for them to you know, lock into, I mean you're going to lose them and then that will be the last job for you. Uh, so it's, it's very, you really have to have that internal metronome going one and two and three in, in your head over and over again. I mean when I'm soloing there's, there's a lot of different types of patterns going through my head. It's almost like uh, and Adam being bombarded because I'm thinking of certain things that I want to play, but then again, I come up with another pattern that just is like spontaneous and it'll t change me 180 degrees into another direction into something. If so, if I'm doing something maybe on the drums, I may hit the cymbal just like over here. I hit that by accident when I was doing something, but I had to react spontaneously and I incorporated that into my system of playing. And then I added another count, and I added a couple other counts. So it sounded like it was part of the uh, of the drum solo, but it really wasn't. It was an accident. But I covered that up. Hi, Merrick. You mentioned that that uh, like timbali off, or like off, off the beat. Well, the timbali pattern is when these guys play. They play over the bar line. They play play like paratriplets. They play. Uh, quintuplets like starting on like off of, on an off beat, right. and it, it's like really weird to follow. Well, I, I've heard that, but what I'm saying is, I wonder if when they do that, usually there's a lot of other stuff. They're, they're that. listening. A Latin band doesn't have a drum set player. There's a timbali yeah. guy. There's a guy in a cowbell. They got all kinds of stuff going. And a weirdo. Yeah. And then it could be like two guys: a guy in timbalis and a guy on the bongos right. and, and whatever. But uh, occasionally. Sometimes that cowbell isn't there for him to lock in on, okay. and, and so I, I've seen that, and I've seen things like, uh, 
end up in, in a train wreck for at least the two or three measures in the beginning until somebody brings them back in on time. So, uh, but yeah, there, there, there's a crux that, that has to be, that he has to lean on, that's for, for solid timekeeping. Uh, with uh, the material uh, for Swing House, it was, it played a proper groove. I mean, Larry doesn't tell me anything. He knows I, I know what I have to do. And then and the kicks and the setups um, and the supports with uh, the accentuations of uh, whether it be the brass, the sopranos, or the mellows. I mean, I use different types of colors for uh, something that's a little bit higher because I have a, an, a range of uh, voices here. I mean, I was on uh, Sabian's uh, a website uh, for at least three and a half hours, I would think, from one o'clock in the morning to whenever. And they have all these colors plus more on the website. So you can go ahead and get a 10 inch splash, press the button, and that's how it'll sound. Uh, Evolution, which is the Dave Weckles, uh, 12 inch splash, uh, these fusion hi-hats. I mean, they have an array of different sounds. So I just wanted to get a mixture of highs, uh, lows, mellows, in between, fast sounding responses, sounds that resonate through uh, a period of seconds. And then that's how I came up with these, uh, you know, this array of symbols. Plus there is, I don't know, maybe about another 10 symbols at home. So uh, uh, it's, it's definitely, and there's more out there, and there's so many other companies, but since I'm a clinician for Sabian, uh, I'll go ahead and talk about it. And, and that's it's fine. It's an offshoot of, of the Zildjian company, which a lot of you people know, and they're in Canada. So, and uh, it just works out really well for me. So, but with, uh, say we're doing something, and the points come in um, on the upbeat of one in the fifth measure. So there's a measure, it's four measures of time. It's, so we're in a swing thing. And then there's a, a downbeat on one, and they pop the upbeat on, on the end of one. So we have one, two, three, four. So they pop that 18 inch uh, crash there, which is strong enough but you should use the, the setup. So the setup could be as simple as just a snare beat on one. Uh, just play one measure of time. One, two, three, four. Back off by putting uh, a rough in there, and I could embellish it and enhances the, the body of the stroke. One, two, three, four. Now, I could also go ahead and move that rough around and split that up between the toms and the bass. One, two, three, four. when they do something, if it's a little bit quicker, and then I'll just put like a whole measure of, of time, and I'll be a little bit louder then, but it's, it's telegraphing to them, look, listen to what's happening, and then come in on the end of one, and make sure you don't miss it. So if you're on the, on the well, the four measures, and then the fourth measure, I'll play the fill. It just telegraphs everything, and sets everything up, and it gives me a little bit more freedom and uh, uh, versatility on the drum set to go ahead and make uh, a musical contribution to what they're doing uh, uh, scenario wise. So I kind of think, that, and we do, the Birdland thing is just like high aggressive, and I kept the same, the same uh, idea that one report had, just the open hi-hat, the cross trim shot. <laughs> solo can change. I can go ahead and change things. Uh, I can even put it in, in like a different meter and even pull the tempo down. It depends on the type of mood and type of feel and type of idea that I want to get across to, uh, to the audience. And also, when I'm playing, I'm also testing and challenging myself. I'm testing myself in such a way that, uh, well, you know, play what you know how to play, but then when something comes up and I'm ad-libbing, I'll uh, get into something else where maybe some sweeps or some crosses or some diddles, split the diddles on the toms 
or cross sticking or whatever it may be or different types of accentuations on, on the symbol. So it's, 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 never, it's never the same. It's not a regimented solo. It's, everything is always different. And because with jazz, I mean, you're constantly, uh, spontaneously creating things. I mean, I don't want to, when I'm looking at, at solos, I don't want to look at the back of the solos because when I'm interacting with the solos, I want to, I read his body language, I'm studying his breathing, I'm listening for certain lines that he's playing and trying to go ahead and guess as to where he's going in the music and trying to go ahead and highlight that with a, a crash cymbal or a, a setup before he hits that. And if he's playing like a trill and he's going, and I'll try to, you know, support that and parallel that with something on the snare drum. So it, it's a study in, in what's going on with other musicians around you and you have to constantly keep your eyes and your ears open and not just your ears. I mean, you constantly watch because certain things think are changing all the time. I mean, if it's supposed to go from the saxophone solos to the trumpet solos, but then the trumpet solos missed it, but then the keyboard will pick it up and then I may change from the hi-hat uh, to the ride cymbal or the ride cymbal to the hi-hat, whatever it may be. So you're, you constantly have, have to be tested and you have to be alert. A lot of drummers really, they play, they get into a groove and they play, and they're fine, there's nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't seem like they're really locking in and listening to what's going on around them. Are they listening to what, what are they playing and how are they playing uh, a certain pattern? Is it too loud or is it not loud enough? Or is it really accenting and supporting what you're actually supposed to be doing for, for the rest of the band? So, I mean, soloing is one thing, but, I mean, the rhythm section, uh, whether it be the electric bass and the drummer or, uh, in the case of swing house, the contrabasses, tubas, and whatever, but locking in and forming a nice cushion, a nice bedding for the rest of the chords to feel relaxed and sit back on. And, and that's, the, that's the whole key for, you know, what, you know, what I do as a, you know, as a profession. So, um, yeah, the drum solo is, is you start with something and you try to keep everybody in, involved and enhanced and glued to what you're doing and with a logical beginning and then whatever happens in the middle and then make sure there's a, an ending that's you know a, a feeling of finality or it kicks the, the horn line in because what I did is after the solo there's like certain symbol cues like Buddy would do and uh, crash, 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 crash and they knew that they had to come in. If somebody missed it, well, I don't see how they could miss it, but if somebody did, well, then somebody else would like pull them in. Larry would catch it all the time, so it, it's no problem, but it may be even longer. It should be crash, two, three, four, then crash, and then a crash, and then crash, and then. So it could be a four-measure setup, could be a two-measure setup. So it's uh, that communication with him and I and certain things with, with the horns, if they're like, like sitting a little bit behind, I'm still going to like push through. The baritones were right you know, next to me, so they were pushing through. Sometimes the sopranos got a little bit behind, and then I'd go ahead and just play like a stronger as two and four in the snare. And if they're listening, they'll pick up on that and make the changes adequately and get back in on time. So, all right. Um, and you can play little tunes on, on, on the drums, too. I'll, you know, I end up with that like later, later on. But on the basis of, of what I said, I mean, is there any, are there any more questions uh, with regards to what's done on this? I mean, I played configurations on the snare and with the flams and then split the flams up between the different types of sonorities on the toms and the snare and also drag figures. Um, and actually, nine-stroke roll. stick now comes up with the thumb up and I'm using these fingers to go ahead and pull the stick into the palm of the hand. And then here when I'm doing left hand work, you see the, the off the thumb bone or the index finger is bouncing it back and kicking it back between the ring finger between these two nails. Or I may turn the middle finger over. try to go ahead and change the grip so things become a little bit more fluent and they go ahead and become a little bit more elongated on, on the instrument. So, all right. Um, where's Bill? Aha, uh -huh, where are we on, on, on the time factor? We got to 15. 215. I have 15 left? No, it's 10 minutes. Up to 215. Well, I don't have, a, oh, well, it's what, five after two, right, right? right. You can leave, you can leave, you can leave. 
Yes, sir. I have a question. Uh, the Tom, Tom tuning and the setup, and my old fashioned or whatever, but I, I always thought the small Tom was to your left and it went down from there. Hey, look at that. Well, I was just curious. How does that happen now? I saw that uh, Anton Fig uh, plays for uh, Letterman, but when Anton Fig couldn't make it, uh, King Hiranov was playing. And then I saw, geez, look at that. And then he, he explained it, just, it's just something different. You know, people, uh, when I set it up like that, you know, you're a left-handed drummer. No, the hi-hats over here. If I was a left-handed drummer, the hi-hat would be over here. Right. So no, it's just something, just something different. And then with the array of symbols, I tried to keep the, the splashes low, and then the upper end at register, the crashes, the 16s and 18s uh, up on the high end. You know, so I can get to these, and uh, it's just it's an easier it's an easier throw with the stick. You know, in, into the different types of uh, uh, sounds to create the different types of colors. But yeah, that's uh, no, you're not old fashioned. Well, yeah. I just no. Did you have to? Did you have to change things around? A period of adjustment for that? Mm, no, because really, when I have this 10 inch, it's 10, 12, 14, 16 with a 22 inch kit. When I was playing certain patterns over here and doing certain cross stickings because the diameter is smaller, I was having a little bit of a problem getting into the drum, hitting the rims a little bit more often. Now when I have a wider diameter, um, wow, I can get into there and I don't have that many uh, nicks and, and clicks or something like that. So it, uh, yeah, it helps. And then when, when I'm filling, I know I have to play, depending on what it is, sometimes this won't project as much as what I would like to. That gives me more depth and more bottom, and it gives me enough pepper range versus just pepper range. And sometimes I do or whatever, and then just move those things around. Uh, I'll play uh, uh, just a, another another solo, and incorporate a, a little tune, which I'm sure you're you're here and, and, and understand. And then uh, uh, that'll be it. So.
Thanks, Jan. Terrific. Tremendous. Another round of applause for Jan.